Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> nice to see you on a sunny Chicago day. <laughs> so, okay, today we are going to get into um, a teaching from Tanya. Now, let me just tell you what Tanya is. Tanya is actually a Hasidic work. Uh, and it is basically Hasidic psychology, at least uh, the first part of it is. Um, later on, it's sort of Hasidic cosmology or um, metaphysics, if you prefer. But the first part of it really deals with uh, psychology to a very large extent. <clears throat> and the way um, human psychology is understood by Kabbalah from a Hasidic point of view. Now, <clears throat> um, first of all, is the sound is okay, I assume, yes? Okay. Sound good? Yes? All right. All right, so we're going to continue now. <clears throat> the first question that the Tanya approaches, the first idea, is what the structure, what the makeup of human motivation is, how are we motivated to do one thing or another thing? How are we motivated to make choices? How are we motivated to structure our lives and our reactions and our interactions in certain ways? Like, what's the, what's, what's the basis behind it? What's, uh, what's the spiritual structure of a human being that so to speak, gives us the choice of going one way or another. So he starts off the Tanya. The author of the Tanya is named someone named Rabbi Shneer Zaman of Liadi. So how does the Tanya um, initially address this issue? So it explains that we have really two sources, primarily two sources of motivation. One source of motivation is um, essentially the concept of self-preservation. And the other one is um, what you would call um, uh, what we'd call self-growth, I guess. I guess that's the, the, the way to put it. Uh, it's more sort of altruistic. I'll explain both of them in a second, but it's sort of more altruistic and seeking Self-betterment, maybe that's the way to, uh, to put it, self-betterment. Now, he notices immediately, or he notes immediately rather, the Tanya notes immediately, that self-preservation is a requirement. It's not that um, self-preservation has anything negative about it, or is in itself intrinsically wrong. Now, in many philosophies, and I believe, although I'm not by any means an expert in this, I believe that in uh, Christian theology and um, perhaps you could say even psychology as well, um, there is an idea that we have become tainted by sin, by uh, the original sin, to the extent that Everything which comes from the self-preservation aspect of ourselves is somehow tainted and wrong and, um, and um, purely self-seeking. Now, Rabbi Shnei Azama notes that this is not necessarily a negative thing. Self-preservation is required. Animals preserve themselves as well. Animals preserve their own lives and make sure they have the, 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 the uh, continuation of their offspring and so on and so forth. And they'll fight uh, any um, predators that try and prevent that from happening. So too, he says, the, um, the instinct for self-preservation is a very powerful one. But it needs to be controlled. It needs to be directed. It needs to be directed in a proper way. Now. This instinct for self-preservation, he calls, essentially, he calls it the animal soul. Why is it the animal soul? Because just like an animal, it has a certain nature, 
that is kind of stamped into it that not only is, uh, is, is it difficult to change, but you could say that it's almost, uh, I wouldn't say impossible, but it's, it's, it's extremely difficult to, to change the nature of that, um, of that animal soul, which seeks its own self-preservation. The problem with the animal soul in a human being <coughs> is that it does more than that. It goes beyond the requirements for self-preservation, and that's where a person's problems start. So the, really, the, 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 the real thing that needs to be done is to limit the self-preservative into the self-preservation instinct to the areas where it is necessary. On the other, that's uh, so. That's the that's the the so to speak the animal soul. Now, just like an animal, a um, uh, whatever. Let take any animal you want, uh, a dog, a, a bird, or whatever it is, has a certain nature, and they are going to they live according to that sort of natural programming that's inbred in them. So to a human being will live according to the natural program that's inbred in him, except that because he has a brain, which I'll speak about in, uh, in a minute, but because he has a brain, so the brain tends to think of situations in the future which may require um, extraordinary means of self-preservation and therefore tries to manipulate the present in order to ensure the future. I'll come back to that uh, shortly. On the other side of the spectrum, you have what is called the godly soul, the divine soul. So you have the animal soul, which is self-preservative, and you have the godly soul, which seeks to better oneself as a human being, seeks to improve one's humanness and um, one's capacity to blend with divine principles or with um, the spiritual inner structure of reality, which I'll get to uh, also shortly. Now, <clears throat> one can see immediately that the difference between humans and animals is that animals have this divine side of themselves, whereas uh, so humans have this divine side of themselves, whereas animals have only the animal side of themselves, right? They have the, um, the self-preservative instinct, the instinct to self-preservation, and um, that doesn't change. Um, a fox is not going to start saving its life or, or, or living its life in the way that a bird does. And a bird is not going to do it the way some way as a fish does and so on and so forth. Every species has their, has their own method of survival. But they don't have the other side of things, the divine aspect to themselves. Now, Rabbi Schneider Zalman points out, and he goes into this in, 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 quite, uh, at, in quite at length, <coughs> that there's often a conflict between these two things. The conflict for self-preservation and the conflict and the, uh, the motivation for self-transcendence, not only self-betterment, but self-transcendence, is a possible source of conflict in every individual. As we can uh, easily understand, self-transcendence is not self-seeking, whereas self-preservation is self-seeking. And that self-betterment or self-transcendence, essentially in its highest form, that self-transcendence um, could lead to results which may seem to the animal side of ourselves, the self-preservative side of ourselves, to be contrary to logic and to be um, detrimental ultimately. So the battle that goes on within us, within, within every human being, the battle between, it's not the battle but so much between good and evil. I think this is one of the fundamental differences that he pointed out, at least in uh, Hasidic psychology and Kabbalistic psychology. We don't necessarily call them good and evil. They could be good and evil, but it's not necessarily the case. These are just two primal forces within a human being. 
and they have to battle it out and make sure that the way a person leads his life is not exclusively or not predominantly um, self-preservative to the exclusion of the other part of himself, and it's not predominantly uh, self-transcendent to the exclusion of self-preservation. There has to be a balance between these two things. What the balance is, is different for different people. The more, the loftier the soul, the loftier the divine soul within a person, generally the more self-transcendent a person is, and therefore the less concern such a person has for self-preservation to the extent that you get a person who is called a tzaddik, a, uh, a righteous person, a, um, a saintly person, who is so spiritually advanced that these things are, so to speak, taken care of for him or her. It's not something that the person has to involve himself with on a, uh, on a daily basis, it's a daily struggle, self-preservation. It happens kind of, to a certain extent, automatically. Not that the person doesn't eat and the person doesn't uh, whatever sleep. Um, yes, they do. But it's not something that, that becomes a motivation in the sense that that's what preoccupies the mind. That's what preoccupies the person. So that battle between these two primal forces <clears throat> is what gives the person sort of a psychological, uh, a psychological, his or her psychological dynamic. And we find um, <clears throat> that in this dynamic interface of these two forces within a person, generally they are not equally balanced, and one is going to dominate. In general, one will dominate. Uh, one will dominate the other. However, <clears throat> a person also has a human uh, has the human intellect. Now, human intellect was given to us in order to be able to discover truth. Intellect can be used, and is used in fact, by both of the motivations within a person, by the self-preservation animal soul, and by the um, self-transcendent godly soul. Both of these um, Oh, I'm going to get, yeah, I'll get you, I'll get back, to, I'll get you in a second, David, I'll discuss that in one second. Um, so, the, uh, the battle between, the, the battle between these two things, both of them use intellect, but they use it in a very different way, which I'll discuss in a second. Let me just get to this um, question that, uh, that was asked. Someone asked the, the following question. You can't always see all the questions, because some of them are sent privately, but, um, uh, the uh, the question is as follows. I'll read the question. You said that uh, so the two the two souls, the two nafashot, are not good and evil necessarily. Aren't they associated with the yetsa tov and the yetsa hara? Aren't they associated with the impetus towards good and the impetus towards evil? Yes, they are. But that impetus impetus towards evil is not necessarily in, in and of itself evil. That impetus, impetus towards uh, self-preservation, which it really is, is a necessary thing, but only it, it, it becomes, it can become something evil when it's completely self-seeking and self-involved. So, <clears throat> um, these motivations, the Yetzir HaTov, the motivation towards good and the motivation towards evil, if you would look at an animal and you would say that, um, you know, an animal in, 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 in hunting its prey, is that animal doing something evil? It's not evil. How else is it going to eat? That's what it eats. It wasn't, uh, you know, you don't see a lion that's a vegetarian. Uh, it just doesn't, uh, it doesn't happen. Uh, and therefore, the... The fact that the lion is hunting the uh, whatever it is, the uh, the buck or whatever, um, is is a completely natural thing. It's not something which needs to be 
um, which needs to be eliminated, otherwise you eliminate the lion as well. So, what we mean to say is that in human being, uh, the impetus towards that self-preservation can become evil actions when it doesn't take, it's, it's not cognizant, when it's not cognizant of the purpose of survival. If the purpose of survival is simply survival, then it can happen in a human being that that survival doesn't take into account the other people around uh, oneself who also are in that struggle for survival and therefore the, um, the entire process can sort of be kidnapped and used for, for, uh, for incorrect things. I'll discuss a little bit more shortly. <clears throat> There's another question. Within the animals and man, there exists a predatory aspect. Could this explain the exploitation of man by man? Yes, definitely. That is, um, the exploitation of man by man is definitely a predatory aspect of the, um, of the animal soul. Now, let's just think about it like this. For, for there to be commerce of any sort, so it's necessary that I get something out of a relationship with you. That a relationship is called exploitation when I'm getting something out of it and you're not. That, 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 that relationship is called commerce or interaction or whatever when both of us are getting something out of it. If I'm cheating you out of your fair share of the, of the relationship and I'm imposing that relationship on, uh, on another person, that would be called, obviously, that would be called predatory. And that would be animal soul without the, uh, without the godly soul. Now, let's just understand that both the animal soul and the godly soul, both of them have a structure. They have a structure of the uh, spherot. Now, let me see if I can. Yeah, here we go. Um, all right. Let me just share the screen. Here we go. Now, as we all know, um, let me just make this a bit smaller so that you can see the whole thing to start off with. I'll make it bigger again later. Okay, good. Uh, as everybody knows, can uh, can you see the uh, the diagram on the on the next page? Yeah. Okay. Very good. So this is the structure that the Kabbalists talk about. The Sfirot, the structure of the Sfirot. These are the 10 Sfirot, and uh, actually if you count them up, you'll see that is 11, because when you count Keter, you don't count Dart. When you count Dart, you don't count Keter. Um, let, me hear, let me show you here. All right, that's Dart. Right, when you count that, you don't count Keta. When you count Keta, you don't count that. Okay, now, these are the structure of the Svirot, and it is also the structure of the soul. The soul descends from the spiritual aspect of a person, whether it's the animal soul or the godly soul, both have these, this tenfold structure because they, they derive from the Svirot. Now, in a, general, in a general sense, this aspect over here of Keter is not so present uh, in the, it's not so present in the animal soul, it's much more present in the godly soul. But let's talk about these three Svirot over here called Chochmah, Bina, and Dat. Chochmah, Bina, and Dat is basically intellect. You can see I've translated them over there as, um, let me make it a little bigger. Um, if I make it a little bigger, 
Let's see. Yeah. Okay. So, Chochmah, Bina, and Dat. So, Chochmah is called wisdom or intelligence. And I'll get to the inner dimension of it shortly. Bina is understanding. Chochmah and Bina. And Dat is consciousness or knowledge, etc. Now, the whole story about the fruit of the tree of, uh, of knowledge of good and evil, the sin, of Adam and, uh, the sin of Adam and Eve, had to do primarily with the idea of attempting to experience everything through myself. Attempting to experience everything through myself. In other words, the person, the person's self became the lens through which he judged the world. Through which he understood the world, or which, uh, through which he or she, obviously, um, had any relationship to the world. Now, that being the case, since that was the case, since this was the lens and this was the focus, that's the focus that they wanted to have, Therefore, they were no longer, the, the truth became obscured. Now, since we're living post that, it's much more difficult to, uh, to be able to see the truth for what it is. So, just to, uh, just, just to point out that, that the, the sin of the tree, will, uh, tree of knowledge of good and evil was that that consciousness that that represents became consciousness of self rather than consciousness of reality or consciousness of truth. Okay, so, both the animal soul, the self-preservative soul, and the godly soul have this identical structure. However, in the godly soul, this structure of Chochmah has an inner dimension, and Bina as well has an inner dimension, and that also has an inner dimension. Whereas the, um, in, in, the, uh, in the animal soul, it does not have this inner dimension. What's the inner dimension of Chochmah? The inner di dimension of Chochmah is this concept of bitul, self-nullification. Self-nullification. And the question, so to speak, that Chochmah will ask itself is, what is my source of inspiration? What inspires me? That's what the, the, the godly soul is always looking for, that divine spark, that divine inspiration. And it's looking to nullify itself to the godliness that it seeks. That's what's called self-transcendence. The same is true on the side of Bina. Bina is generally called understanding or joy. But in the... Um, in, in, um, in Bina, it is much more a concept of analysis and comprehension and understanding why do I do what I do? Why do I do what I do? Not uh, what inspires me, but understanding what it is that I do, what the reasoning is behind why I should act in a certain way. Dat, the inner dimension of Dat, is actually, well, first it's the key to emotions, but that's the outer aspect. The inner aspect of Dat is the idea of intimate connection, intimate connection with that which is above me, that which transcends me. It's focus, a connection on that which transcends me. Now, the animal soul doesn't have any of these um, any, any of these three qualities. These three qualities in the animal soul are simply survival instincts. All it needs to know is how do I survive the situation that I'm in? How do I preserve my existence and the existence of the species or the existence of my uh, progeny in such a situation? That's what it will look at. Now, we can understand that 
the motivations of these two things can be contradictory. However, because we are intellectual, we are human beings with a brain, it doesn't necessarily have to be contradictory because we can explain to ourselves, we can explain to ourselves how to bring these two aspects of ourselves into alignment. Now, how do you bring the two aspects of a person? How does the person bring the two aspects of himself into alignment, herself into alignment, when the, the self-preservative aspect of ourselves is serving the self-transcendent? Or it's helping the self-transcendent to bring that self-transcendency into reality in the world in which we live. Now, this is a difficult thing. It's not, it's not, it's not an easy thing. Uh, it's not an easy thing to accomplish. It's obviously not easy to accomplish, but that is the beginning of how psychological, the psychological dynamics of um, Kabbalistic thought start to work. It really begins, in fact, from a higher level. These levels in the godly soul ultimately serve the highest level of the soul, the highest level of the soul being. The question is, for what purpose am I here? What is my purpose in the world? Once a person discovers or works towards, discovers his purpose or works towards a certain purpose in life, then all of the faculties, including all of them all the way down, all of the faculties of a person will generally be channeled into that, um, into, into that uh, format, into the format of what is my purpose. Although the animal soul also has intellect, the intellect of the animal soul is not in the service of what is my purpose. The intellect of the animal soul is generally um, involved with the emotional aspects of a person. They're there sort of to bolster or to explain to oneself, if you could say it like that, um, why I'm having this particularly emotional reaction. And usually not just to explain why I'm having the emotional reaction or the emotional um, makeup of a person, not just to explain it, but actually to justify it. So we find that there are really two different directions that they go. The, the, the godly soul is primarily concerned with um, these faculties serving my purpose. Whereas these faculties, sorry, sorry whereas the intellectual faculties are in, in the animal soul are primarily co concerned, excuse me, with justifying my activities. Now, the rectification of the animal soul the rectification of the animal soul is, first of all, to bring it into line with what my, what my purpose is, and then to make a balance so that the mind ultimately controls the emotions. This is a fundamental concept which has later been discovered by uh, psychologists um, in fairly recent, uh, fairly recent times. Let's say the last... Um, <clears throat> 30, 40 years, maybe, maybe 50 years, uh, where, the, where psychologists have also discovered um, uh, the this, uh, this same idea that the way I think about things is the way I feel about things and therefore eventually the way I behave. It's one of the strongest um, modes of, of psychological activity today is uh, of, of working uh, with people who don't have mental illnesses per se, but they have, uh, you know, maybe um, let's call them disorders or imbalances. So one of the one of the best ways of of dealing with this is is, is something that's called reframing. 
It's like a lot reframing the picture. In other words, reframing the way that the intellect understands and therefore affects the emotions. So if a person is highly emotional about certain things, one can restructure the understanding in order to affect the emotion. That's called reframing. Now, the ultimate reframe is to reframe the intellect to understand what my purpose is in life, and then everything else follows essentially from that. Now, let me just take a couple of questions here. Um, uh, one, and one question which maybe you can't see is, is the animal soul more drawn, drawn to nature than the divine soul? Um, I would think yes, but nature is not one of the divine, so I'm not sure. Um, let's put it this way. The animal soul is drawn towards natural activity in the sense that um, when we talk about nature, we could talk about um, those things which in a person are generally unchanging. I need to eat, I need to sleep, I need to, um, you know, just the, the, um, the, the, the natural cycles of a person's life that, uh, that a person goes through. Uh, if we're calling that nature, yes, then uh, the animal soul is more drawn towards nature. Is that a negative thing? No, that's also a positive thing. It has, there are definitely um, divine ideas which are implanted within the physical world. The physical world, after all, uh, in, in Kabbalah, the word for world is called Hateva. I'm just going to write it in the chat over here. Hateva, te, or just Teva, but Hateva. Hateva meaning the nature. It's the, uh, the, the um, uh, definite article of nature, nature, right? So Hateva is... Uh, if you add up the letters in Hebrew, um, it comes out to 86, which is the gematria of Elohim, right? One of the names of God, right? God within nature, Elo is, the name Elo Elohim is God within nature. So a person's nature is godly, but it is limited godliness. It's limited to a certain um, spectrum of behaviors. Are those behaviors going to be self-limiting? Are those behaviors going to be self-destructive? Or can one structure the behaviors in such a way that they serve a higher purpose, the purpose of the divine soul? Oh, I, I didn't type it into the thing. Okay, there we go. Hateva equals 86, and that equals uh, Elohim. Okay, so when we talk about nature, yes, that is an animalistic thing, but within nature itself, godliness is concealed. Nature itself is a godly aspect as well, and if it can be harnessed in the right way, then it's, um, it, it can become a very positive thing. All right, so let me see um, a couple more questions. Therefore, the intellect controls the heart, and the heart is animalistic. The heart can be animalistic until it's transformed. Yes, the heart is reactionary. The heart reacts. As you know, when you get frightened, right, all of a sudden your heart starts beating wildly. When a person's calm, the heart, uh, in other words, you can see how the mind affects the heart because when a person's in a state of panic, let's say, and you explain to them or you have some way of, 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 of motivating the intellect to calm the heart down, then that's the, best, uh, that's the best way to do it, right? The mind does control the heart. Um, and <laughs> um, I'll tell you a little experience that I had once. It was actually quite, uh, quite amusing. <laughs> Um, I went to, I, I used to uh, give blood quite a lot because I have not such a common blood type, but um, I used to donate blood. When I lived in Israel, I donated blood quite, uh, quite often. And um, always before you donate blood, so they take, your, uh, they take your pulse just to make sure that you, you, know, you don't have an erratic heart or that um, you know, you're, you're, and they take your blood pressure just to make sure that you're... Uh, you know, your blood pressure is not uh, way up or whatever. Okay, so 
one of the things I used to do when the nurses were, were taking my pulse is um, I, would, I would think about, I would, make, I, would, I would try and control my pulse with, <laughs> with my mind, making it go faster and slower and slower and faster, and they would go nuts. Like, oh, wait a second, your pulse seems to be going slower now. What happened here? And then it was going racing, you know, and it was all because I was using uh, just imaging certain things to make the pulse go up. It was just out of, you know, out of fun, whatever. But, um, but anyway, it can be, you can see that, that you know, if you, if, you, uh, if you work on it, you can even actually get your pulse to be controlled by your mind, even your pulse, which seems to be a completely natural thing. And you can see that because a person starts to get afraid, all of a sudden the pulse, uh, pulse rate uh, speeds up because the heart speeds, uh, speeds, up, uh, speeds up. Okay, so one can do this. It's not such a, uh, an unusual thing. The intellect does control the heart. And the heart is largely simply a pump. It is called the source of the emotions, and not that the heart itself is the source of the emotions, but that the heart is the mirror, essentially, of the emotions. Because when a person is calm, the heartbeat is long and slow. When a person is uh, excited, the heartbeat is fast. If he is or she is worried, uh, and so on and so forth, it, it shows up in the pulse beat. In fact, there are Kabbalists, I don't believe any in America, but there are Kabbalists in Israel who um, can tell what a person is all about from his pulse beat. They simply take the pulse beat and they, uh, they, they um, sort of tap into it from there and understand like, where the person's imbalances are and, where, uh, and what can be done to straighten things out. So um, it is, it's a very it's a very interesting um, technique and um, ability, but uh, yes, it can be done. One of course has to be extremely sensitive to uh, to very very minor changes and so on. Um, but it can be it's something that one can be uh, one can learn, be trained in, and so on. Uh, okay, another question. Isn't the, only, isn't the only purpose of our creation is for the Creator to reveal Himself through us, that we know His names and appellations, how do we find our corporeal purpose that coincides and completely complements the purpose? Thus we bring contentment to the Creator. Yeah, uh, that is, uh, yeah, the, all of what you said is, uh, is, uh, is true. All of what you said is true. Um, now, what the purpose is for one particular individual or another particular individual is let's not make it so ethereal as to talk about it as knowing his names and appellations and so on and so forth. But simply, what can I do? And the person has to ask himself this on a really on a daily basis. What can I do to make the world around me a better place for everybody? Whether it's a better place in terms of, uh, of being a calm atmosphere whether it's a better place in terms of being an, a, a, an atmosphere there where, where one can feel connected to the one above, whether it's um, uh, an atmosphere of family harmony involved together in a certain, um, uh, you know, in, 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 in a certain purpose which the family chooses or which sort of naturally falls into their lap, that kind of thing. It doesn't have to be every minute of the day. We, you know, this can be certain minutes of the day. But that's what, you know, prayer, morning prayer is all about. Morning prayer is essentially getting into that uh, harmony. It's tapping into, um, you know, people make the, make the mistake that prayer is essentially speaking to God. That's one aspect of prayer. The other aspect of prayer, and, and equally important, and in some cases more important, is listening. The central, that prayer can really be divided into, into two parts. Well, there's really three parts, but uh, one is a meditation on nature, and that's the first part. The, the middle part is um, focusing on the divine, focusing on godliness. And the third part is presenting one's requests in prayer. The middle part, focusing on godliness, the central prayer of that is called the Shema prayer. What does Shema mean? It means to listen, to hear, to listen. So the whole, really the point of prayer is to get us to listen to the messages that are coming from above, to get us to listen to the messages. Uh, it's not so much about 
what we can do for God as hearing what it is that God wants from us. I think that that's the, um, that's the, uh, the most important uh, aspect of it. Now, um, this is the reason that a few minutes spent every day in prayer is, uh, is a good thing. And again, it's not only the request aspect of it, it's focusing on the wonders of nature, and then it's focusing on what message is coming to me from above. And of course, it takes a certain sense of sensitivity and a certain amount of time to be able to figure that out. And then requests come last. Okay. Uh, maybe the divine soul is really the instruction. Yeah, it is. You could say it's the instruction of the Torah. It is the, it is the code that runs the divine soul. Yeah, that's what it is really. Uh, the... the, the um, the soul is the, is the the divine soul is 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 sort of God's code within us, which allows us to transcend ourselves and bond with something beyond ourselves, bond with uh, God and is beyond ourselves. Famous story with Napoleon. Yes, yes. Alex is pointing out the famous story with Napoleon. Yes. Uh, actually, the person. Let, let me just tell you what the story with Napoleon is. There was a um, the author of the Tanya. The author of the Tanya was being pursued by Napoleon. He was being pursued by Napoleon. Napoleon very much wanted to capture Rabbi Shneur Zaman of Liadi. And uh, the reasons that are given was essentially that he understood that the opposition, the fiercest opposition to him in Russia came not from when he was fighting the Russian armies, came not from the Russian army itself, but from a certain spirit of opposition that was really coming from a spiritual place. And he discovered it. He discovered somehow or another, let's not get into the details of how, but he discovered that the source of this opposition was Rabbi Shnei Zaman Liadi. And he wanted to capture him. Now, Rabbi Shnei Zaman Liadi was very, very aware of this. And he had a follower who he sent as a spy. Why did he send this particular person as a spy? To see what Napoleon was actually doing, what, he was, uh, what was going on. He sent him as a spy because this particular man was expert in many, many languages. He could speak. He had, he had this, he was a, um, what do they call a polyglot, I think, right? Um, someone who had the ability to speak many languages. And one of the languages he spoke fluently besides Russian, he spoke French. So he offered his services to Napoleon's army as a translator. And of course, then he would understand, he would hear what was going on, he would hear all the planning and so on and so forth. Now, Napoleon, after a while, got suspicious that this man was a spy. And he called all the staff, all his staff together, and he said, there is a spy amongst you who is giving all the secrets to... Uh, you know, the secrets of what's going on in our army is giving over there to, uh, to the enemy. And he walked around, he looked at everyone in the face, he looked at everyone, he went around everybody, and all of a sudden he, he uh, shot out his hand and he put his hand on this man's heart. This man, his name was Moshe Belenka. He put his hand on his heart and he said, and it's you. And Moshe Belenka said about that particular time, he said that he used all the strength of his mind to control his heart so that his heart wouldn't beat inordinately, far, uh, inordinately fast. And after a while, Napoleon could feel that his heart was not uh, uh, full of fear. And so I said, okay, it's not you. And, uh, but he couldn't figure out who it was. So uh, that's the story with Napoleon that Alex uh, mentioned. So you can see the mind controls the heart. Uh, so, Terry, the unique consciousness of fundamental man is free will to reflect upon his own consciousness. The question I have is the nature of consciousness. Um, yes, we can speak about the nature of consciousness shortly or on another occasion because it's getting late already. Um, let, let's leave it for another time and perhaps I can speak about that next uh, Sunday, uh, Terry, okay? Uh, the Gematria of the Heart is 32, is the number of levels of consciousness. Uh, yeah, yeah, the Lama based Nesivas Chochma, the 32 paths of wisdom or the 32 paths of consciousness which go into the heart. Yes, 
Uh, right. Uh, hypnosis, very interesting, very powerful stuff and useful when used appropriately. Yes, hypnosis is very useful. Uh, there are various kinds of hypnosis, as you know. The best kind of hypnosis is actually the best type of hypnotist is an Ericksonian, one who followed the teachings of Milton Erickson, uh, who was a mass master hypnotist, but also someone who did not manipulate people in negative ways, which unfortunately many hypnotists, hypnotists do. And um, um, they also are not able to really rectify a person's uh, inner consciousness in such a way. Uh, is anyone familiar with Arizal Vital Translation, The Tree of Life by Menzi and Pana Arizal Publications? I'm not familiar with it. Um, it's Chaim by Menzi and Pana. No, I'm not familiar with it. Um, I'm not familiar with it personally, but there are um, there are excerpts from the Tree of Life in a book which I actually edited, which is called um, it's by someone named Moshe Vishnevsky. Um, I forget what it's called now. I have to look. Um, okay, therefore, Le 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 Levitical sacrifice is communicating with God. That is Leviticus. Yeah, I mean, the, the sacrifice is part of the sacrifice that Ramban, Rabbi Nachmanides, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, explains that the whole purpose of sacrifice was to, it was really what was, what was going on in the, in the sacrifice, sacrificial things was a, uh, the sacrifice of the animal soul within us. That's what, even though it was a sacrifice in a physical sense, the real target was the animal within us. Now, we can't do those anymore because we don't have the temple and we don't have temple times. So therefore the elevation won't happen. Don't try animal sacrifice at home. But there is a concept of animal sacrifice immediately within um, the whole section that starts to talk about uh, the, all the sacrificial section, the book of Leviticus essentially it begins with Vayikra Hashem El Moshe. It's called Vayikra in Hebrew. Uh, let me just write that down here in, in English. Vayikra. And in Hebrew, uh, there we go. Vayikra. Now the Aleph, the Aleph of, um, the Aleph of Vayikra, that Aleph over there is in the Torah, it's a small Aleph. It's a small aleph rather than a rather than a big one, or rather than a regular size one. It's small. Why? Because and it's explained that this is the this is the voice of God that's within us, which is the small still voice, which calls out to us. The word vayikra means to call out, and He called out to Moses. Right? That is available to us, but it's only there as a very small still voice. And that calling is that calling out to us to call out and humanize the animal soul within us, or offer it up to a higher level. The Leviticus does get downplayed sometimes. The Genesis said not realizing the important messages. Yes, there are some very important messages in Leviticus. Uh, it's just that, uh, you know, the modern mind is so, um, sacrifice seems such an, an odd and foreign concept and really, it is in many ways. It is an odd and foreign concept to uh, to the modern to the modern mind that um, people do tend to ignore it to a certain extent. But there are definitely some very interesting um, lessons that come out of it. Now, when a person is a um, when a person becomes a saintly person, a tzaddik, that means essentially that he has elevated the animal soul. It says about King David uh, uh, that his, his animal soul was empty within him. That previous, that pro, pro, former motivation of self-seeking motivation that um, that he'd had, he'd managed to, so to speak, kill it, 
he did it by fasting and various other things, mostly by fasting, and we shouldn't do that. Uh, we're, we're too weak to do that, and it's not, it's not, it's not the ideal way of doing it uh, today at all. But he um, completely got rid of it by this process of self-control, which is fasting is really self-control. It's ignoring the hunger when it's there and so on and so forth. He, he, fasted, he would fast sometimes for, for weeks on end. Um, just breaking a fast, like, I mean, there's many people that did the Baal Shem Tov also would fast from, uh, day, if he would fast the whole week and only eat once a week. And fast the whole week, only eat once a week. Now, we should not do that. I must repeat that. We shouldn't do it today. The physical body is just not capable of doing such a thing. It's, uh, in fact, it is uh, detrimental. And it's certainly not the Hasidic way to do that kind of thing. Um, to, um, possibly cause oneself some harm for the sake of dubious results. And I say dubious results because when, um, when a person fasts, so the today, the moods that are created by such things, I mean, we, we're not talking about just the obligatory fast, like, um, uh, the Fast of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and uh, the Ninth of Av, with these of the obligatory rabbinical and biblical fasts that we do. But if a person fasts more than that, more than those fasts, there's a very strong possibility that not only will he not uh, weaken the animal soul, but he would he could strengthen it. We're just, it's, not, it's just not the way to go today. There's other things that can be done other than fasting. One of the things that can be, um, that, uh, that some people do, and again, this is not necessarily recommended for everybody. It's only if a Kabbalist tells you to do it, is to take a day where you don't speak. It's called Tani's Dibur. A day where you don't, you don't speak. Now, if you have children and you have a wife or a husband or whatever it is, it's not advisable to, uh, especially, <laughs> especially if you have a boss, it's not advisable to, um, to necessarily do that, uh, that kind of thing. It could be detrimental again, but there is such a thing. It could be time is deep for a certain amount of hours. Uh, like I know that there, were, there, there, there are certain, uh, certain friends that I have that... Um, before prayer, until they finish prayer, they don't talk. They don't talk to anybody. They won't talk until they finish the morning prayers. And after that, they'll talk. Um, but also simply holding oneself back from saying things which are hurtful or harmful or vulgar, that's also called Tanis Dibur. That's also fasting to a certain extent. Um, and, uh, yeah, so someone pointed out over here, the whole method of going with minimal food is not done without training the happy and peaceful people. Yeah, yeah, it can be. On the other hand, there is also the training that's necessary to be able to eat with the right intention. If one can eat with the right intention, that is more powerful than minimal eating. Of course, that doesn't mean one uh, has to overdo it, but um, yes. Uh, someone pointed out in chapter 44 of Tanya, the altar compares hidden love in the heart of every to a love of a child for his parent, noting ability for self-sacrifice. seems that parents are more likely to self-sacrifice for the sake of their children. Come assume that parents love the children more than the other way around. Um, I think that's, yeah, things are a little different in America, huh? <laughs> Um, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised how many people are, there are. I mean, when children are young, when they're little youngsters, you know, yes, that's true, that they don't really appreciate parents. But as people grow older, I think they do appreciate parents. And I think that um, many, not everybody, obviously, but many people were, you know, would be um, very willing to sacrifice. I, mean, I remember a story, actually. There was a... Um, um, a member of the Israeli parliament, a religious member of the Israeli parliament. He, was, he belonged to a party called Aguda. 
Agud is a religious party in the Israeli government. So this particular man had, um, he had some um, kidney disease. Um, and he had to get, he had to get uh, both of his kidneys removed and he was on dialysis uh, for, um, to look at find a donor. So he happened to have eight sons had a lot of kids, but uh, he had eight sons. And all of them would have been good matches for their father for a kidney. All of them were um, family men. They were all married and had their own children to look after. And obviously, uh, functioning on one kidney is not as good as functioning on two. An argument developed amongst the sons who would have the privilege of donating a kidney to their father? And the oldest one claimed the privilege because he said since he's the Bechor, since he was the firstborn and firstborn son, and in uh, Jewish thought, Jewish practice, that has a certain status. So he said, I have the first choice, and I'm going to donate my kidney. Since I'm given the first choice, I'm taking it. And I'm the one. But the interesting thing is that they were all arguing and arguing fiercely amongst themselves who would have the privilege until he claimed on basis based on the law of the Torah that he had the, he had the right to, <laughs> to have a first, uh, first offer. Um, so you see that there are children that, that, that have that kind of love for their parents as well. When they're younger, they probably don't, but uh, hopefully... Later on, when they get when they get older, probably um, you know they might be able to come to that. Now, it's not necessarily true that all you know parents are going to be. Um, it's not true that all parents necessarily educated their children in this kind of way, and therefore it could well be that you know the parents are not going to be have the have the same um, good fortune. <laughs> But um, hopefully there is a, a strong connection between, uh, between children and parents so that it's not that the parents are more willing to give to the children. And, uh, you know, that may be at a certain stage, but the other way around. In any event, um, you can understand that the, the, uh, the analogy is, is simply a, um, you know, you can use the analogy in, a, in whichever way you want um because we see that it does work both ways. Um uh Davina's question at eleven forty nine. Why would anyone think of this? Let me see, eleven forty nine. That's a good way of pointing it out. Okay. Can women also recite the Shema? Of course. Of course, absolutely. Uh absolutely. Um women do recite the Shema and um it's just that they're not time-bound like men. Men have to recite it um, by a certain time of the day um, and a certain time of the night, whereas women are not time-bound by that thing. Um, generally, time is much less of a factor in um, female um, consciousness and therefore in the, in the consciousness or the relationship of women to to godliness, uh, time is not as important uh, a factor. Does that mean that uh, all women are not, you know, not prompt and not on time and so on and so forth? Well, there might be something to that, actually, yes, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um, uh, it's it just not because they have other obligations, you know, usually obligations towards children, family, and things like that. So they're not time bound by the Torah to. <laughs> To these kinds of things, yes, um, that's just the way it is. You know, let's let's leave it at that. You know, some um, not not everyone is like that, but there um, um, there are some people that are not. I don't know. Some people have a very a very powerful internal clock, and some people do not. Um, I remember there was a time when I was younger. Uh, I never carried. I, I very just. I'm. A, I just like carrying a watch. I, I never I wore a watch for a while as a kid, but I, I. I don't like carrying a watch on me. It's. I just find it uncomfortable, and uh, 
whatever, so I never have a watch on me. I was always able to tell the time so accurately <laughs> that it was, as if it, it was as if I had a digital watch on me. It was really, it was really quite amazing. I mean, you know, almost to the second. So, um, um, you know, it's a talent that some people have, and they, they, they're they very aware of time and very uh, focused on time. Now, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, why is time less of a factor for females? Um, because they're living within, you see, time is a function of the sphira of Malchut. Malchut is a feminine sphira. Because she's living within that sphira, so to speak, that's her primary uh, sphira in terms of her femininity. She's living in the stream of time. And therefore, it's difficult for her to make that time an objective thing outside of herself to make an objective outside of herself men are living in much more living in space than in time if uh, let me just switch it here to the share screen I'll show you what I mean again time is a function of the sphira of Malchut Hashem Melech Hashem Malach Hashem Yimloch past present and future is a function of Malchut, whereas space is a function of what the, the Sfirot of Zer Anpin, Zer Anpin is these six Sfirot, yeah, the six sides to space. The six sides are north, south, uh, east, and west, and above and below. Right, so men live much more, they're much more, now, we're not talking about individually necessarily, but in general, men are much more space conscious, they might live much more in space, so space is more important to them in the sense that um, uh, men are much more territorial than women, let's put it that way, in general. Right? Men are more territorial than women. Why? Because they're space-bound. Whereas women are within the flow of time and therefore don't see it as objectively. Men, because they're in space, can see time more objectively and therefore are more aware of time. Whereas women, because they're in the flow of time, are less aware of it as an objective thing. Now, again, it's only in a general sense, so don't take it personally, anybody who... There are some ladies, my, wife, my, my mother included, who are very, very time conscious and very, um, um, you know, aware of time as it's, uh, as it's passing and, uh, and so on and so forth. But we're talking about in a general sense, you know, in, a, in, in, a, in the spiritual build uh, of, of males and females. That's just the way it is. Uh, now, I'll tell you an interesting story, um, which I may have mentioned here before, but nevertheless, it's a nice story, so I'll tell you. There was a certain person that went in to the, uh, to the study of Rabbi Shneir Zan Maliadi, the author of the Tani that we were speaking about. And um, they were discussing various, uh, various issues, various um, ideas. Um, and <coughs> Rabbi Shneir Zan Maliadi got called out for a minute. So he went out. And when he came back, he looked at his clock and he said, um, did you adjust my clock? So he said, yes, I adjusted your clock. I have a timepiece. And he takes out this fob watch that he had in his pocket. And he said, I have a timepiece that was made in Switzerland that is, keeps perfect time. It keeps perfect time. Uh, doesn't lose uh, a second. And I've had it wound up for, uh, in those days there were no automatic watches. I had wound up in the last three years. It's only lost one second in the last three years. Sarah Mishnah Zaman looked at him and he says, yeah, my clock, my clock, this clock here, runs on the permutations, on the changing permutations of the divine names. So it's better not interfere with it. <laughs> so, um, um, obviously that was so. Uh, and that's just a little story about time. Okay. Um, Okay, so, Chavad uh, Org gives times for many things, including times for prayers. Yes, uh, the men have to know those things. Um, Anna says, I'm still stuck on food. Is blessing the food something you can give a class about? Was ringing about it. I only see gratitude at this point. Yes, I can discuss that certainly in a, in a, in a, in a future class. 
Uh, Wisniewski, not finding it on Google. Here we are. Apples in the Orchard, that's what it's called. I just remember the book's called Apples. Apples in the Orchard, or Apples from the Orchard. I think Apples from the Orchard. Apples from the Orchard, I think that's what it is. And his first name is Moshe. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Wendy. Uh, you have the book. Yeah, if you have a look over there, you'll see. I think it mentions my name in the beginning as one of the editors or whatever. He's a very good friend of mine, very good friend of mine. We're uh, been friends for many, many years. All right, folks. Um, I think that at this point in time, I think we are going to uh, call it a day.